guys. It was a league where players who should have been in the NBA found that as a substitute. There was only 16 places in the United States that you could play professional basketball. Eight teams in the NBA and eight teams in the Eastern Basketball League. We played teams like Allentown and Wilkesboro, Scranton, Williamsport, Hazleton, Baltimore, Sunbury. And we had good crowds. You know, that's before TV became dominant. So if you wanted to see something, you had to come out and see it. You play three nights a week. You play Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And if you got, you know, pay $100 a night, that's $300 extra a week. Some of the greatest players in the world were in the Eastern League playing on the weekends. You're talking about Hal Lear, you're talking about Wally Choice, Jack McCluskey, Jack Ramsey, John Chaney. John Chaney, he was a great player. Oh, man, this guy was some guy. John Chaney was a ball handler extraordinaire. Tremendous shooter. He uh, was a rebounder. He was a ferocious defender. A very, very tough, tenacious, physical, defensive player. He wanted to play the players on the other team that were the good players offensively. He was a guy who would guard you to the point of death. Teeth in my stomach, and I just wouldn't let you beat me. Just wouldn't. John Cheney should have gotten a chance to play in the NBA. He would have been in the pros easily, but they weren't ready for, for too many of us in those days. I just wanted to play. And Stan Novak, who was coaching up in the Eastern Professional Basketball League, came to my house and told my family that they wanted me to come to the Eastern Pro League where I could come back teaching it in the, in, in the days, in the weekdays, and then play basketball on the weekends, earn money. I said, well, yeah, I'm coming back home to the state of Pennsylvania. I was raised and born in Jacksonville, Florida. It was an area called Black Bottom. Whenever it rained for any great length of time, water would come up right onto the porch and right into the living room area, into the shed kitchen area. And I can remember my mom many times sitting in water, baking a cake and a frog in the kitchen, you know, jumping around and hopping around. And uh, we'd be jumping at the frog. This was, uh, this was just a way of life that we'd gotten used to. But when he was 14, John Cheney and his family moved north. We knew we were coming to the north, so we thought the north was snowing. We thought it was going to be cold here. Halfway here, my aunt and my mother said, all right, go in the bathroom. Put on your long drawers. When we got in 30th Street Station in Philadelphia, in July, you talking about hot. <laughs> we were sweating. When we got out that cab down in South Philly, Everybody in the block was looking at us, and they just knew they had one. They had a sucker, believe me, because we just looked like, look at all the tall buildings. Cheney's competitive drive paid off. In 1951, he was named Philadelphia's High School Player of the Year. Yet here I am playing basketball in a city where a great deal of the players were white. Tom Gola, my dear friend Tommy, he was the most valuable player in the Catholic League. Here he is, he's going on to LaSalle. Here I am, there wasn't a scholarship offered to me in this city. Eventually, Big House Gaines from Winston-Salem was interested in me, but another historic black school came in, put me on a train one day before Big House got here, and took me to Bethune-Cookman College in Daytona Beach. Oh, he put up big numbers up there. And when Bethune came to town, I mean, it would be sellout crowd. They'd come to see him. They used to say JC for Jesus Christ. He was that kind of basketball player. He played, now he, he, he ain't passing the ball to nobody. <laughs> I'd go through there and score 37, 43, 32. But it was just like zip, zap. It was done, and it was over, and nobody remembers it. After graduating from Bethune-Cookman in 1955, Cheney starred in the Eastern League. 
but he never played in the NBA. You mean to tell me you didn't see that I was the best player in the city? You wouldn't keep watch of me as I went on to college and to see what I accomplished in the Eastern League. Something was wrong there, and it simply meant that they were deliberately um, keeping away from black players. They just did it. As you know, the Supreme Court of the United States has decided that separate public educational facilities for the races are inherently unequal, and therefore compulsory school segregation laws are unconstitutional. Our personal opinions about the decision have no bearing on the matter of enforcement. In 1954, the country started to change, however reluctantly. Separate was no longer equal, and the new Supreme Court ruling affected the basketball world as well. While many educational institutions resisted this change, others quickly recognized the financial benefits. Increasingly, predominantly white universities began recruiting black ball players, including four who were destined to be superstars. Guys from D.C. said, we got a player in D.C., his name is Elgin Baylor. Guys from Indiana, they said, well, we got a player in Indiana, his name is Oscar Robertson. So I said, well, they're good. I said, but I'm from Philadelphia. We got a guy in Philadelphia, his name is Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> He's gonna change the game. years now and I marvel at just watching him play. His ability to block shots and to get about two feet over the basket is our wonderful asset for having him there. He I see what you mean. <laughs> well, Bill Russell was the best. When I first played basketball, my idol in the game came Bill Russell. Bill Russell was left-handed. Bill Russell was born in Monroe and lived in Monroe till he was 12 years old. So, so I mean, I had a perfect guy to, for an idol, you know. Ironically, as predominantly white institutions desegregated their basketball teams, the programs at black colleges suffered the consequences. When the white schools integrated, they, they didn't do it out of the goodness of their hearts. It, it, was, it, was a, it was an economic thing. And when they started recruiting the black athletes, it started having an effect on the black college athletic programs because they would take the best athletes. They were after our kids and they were getting them. Bill Russell went to the University of San Francisco. Elgin Baylor went to Seattle University. Oscar Robertson attended University of Cincinnati. And Wilt Chamberlain went to Kansas. Four black superstars at predominantly white universities. And that's the big fellow, Wilt Chamberlain, Center University of Kansas. Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell uh, were playing on television. Howdy, Wilt. Here, everything was light, and they were powerful, and they were sure and certain. By contrast, all around me, things were dark in all manner of ways, and so uncertain. It created a sense in me of a need to find a better life somewhere, and uh, try to find that life that uh, Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain were having. In the meantime, two stars from historically black colleges, Woody Salisbury and Earl Lloyd, had made their starting teams in the NBA. I was rookie of the year in 1957-58 season. Woody Salisbury was a great player. A lot of agility, good speed, good hands. 
Woody was, what, 6'8", 6'9", about 240. And could score. But how I made it, I think, mostly defense. That's the only way I got to play when I got to Philly. The Hawks haven't scored a basket in almost six minutes. I didn't know I could play defense until I come in the NBA. Black players coming into the NBA were never able to really show their full talent. They were really role players. So Earl Lloyd ended up being a defensive player for the Syracuse Nationals, a rebounder, and a guy that set screens, and somewhat of a tough guy for them. But never a situation where they were integrated into the offense. Earl Lloyd was never really accepted on or off the court, despite being a starter on an NBA championship team in 1955. But in some cases, that would change. The great skills of Sam Jones, one of John McClendon's star guards at North Carolina College, were being recognized by his Boston Celtics teammates. And nobody, including Red Auerbach, wanted him to change his style. Sam Jones was ahead of his time. I knew Sam when he was in high school. His basketball skills then were superior to what you see from most guys now. Now that's the guy, my goodness, you talking about shooter. He wouldn't pass the ball. He'll shoot you in a game and out of me. Sam Jones shooting and connecting. Sam Jones shows why he's the Celtics' top point producer. Bill Russell said, Sam Jones is the number one clutch shooter in the history of NBA basketball. Sam shooting, it's good. When Red Auerbach called timeout, he said the last shot was for Sam Jones. With the final whistle, Sam Jones has the ball, and he lets it go with a whoop. By the late 1950s, more and more black players and coaches were having an effect on the game. John McClendon had been lured to Tennessee A&I by its president, Walter Davis. His plan was to use athletics to put that university on the national map. And he knew about Coach McClendon. He recruited him very, very aggressively and told Coach McClendon, if you want to make your mark on a national scale, you need to come to my institution. And it was seductive. Coach McClendon went. The molding of the Tennessee a &I Tigers was very well organized and orchestrated by Coach McClendon. He recruited players to fit into a system. And in 1955, one of his first recruits was schoolboy legend Dick Barnett. I call Mike Lennon a iron fist in a velvet glove. Never really raised his voice, never uh, cursed, never used the uh, intimidating statements to players. He cared about you not just as an athlete, but as a productive citizen that's going to go out and make your way in the world. Dick Barnett's Coach McLennan's special project from Gary, Indiana. He's one of those guys now what, uh, two or three slept in one bed. Uh, Coach McLennan loved him. My father was a laborer. We lived in a segregated society. Roosevelt was all black school, and most other schools in Gary were white. He came to see my parents and to, you know, we love for your son to come to Tennessee State. I had no, uh, of course, they had no reference to colleges except for what they might have seen on television or something like that. But fortunately, I saw a different world. And my aspiration was not to work in the steel mills of Gary. You don't Dick Barnett had a glorious high school career. Dude. 
Good. I played against Oscar Robertson 